call it. I am one of your hosts, Jeff. And I'm Dave. Dave, you look a, a little odd. Well, uh, since we last talked, I joined a satanic occult. Nice. This is my new outfit. I have to wear it <laughs> around while I'm an acolyte. Oh, that's, uh, that's excellent. Also joining us from way down south is Sir Winston, Winston Churchill. Churchill. Yep. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. <laughs> excellent, Winston. I love the way you, you wiggled his head a little bit. <laughs> oh, just, just to emphasize the points. Yeah, so there you go. You got that going for you. Now you're stuck with me. Dave, I think you need a hat and a cigar and maybe lose the hoodie. How about Diet Coke? It's a little frightening looking. Anyway, welcome, everybody. We're This is our uh, hangout right, number five or something like that. Well, hey, I really haven't introduced myself. I think I'm Winston Churchill. Oh, yeah. Oh, they do. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead, Rich. This is the world-famous Rich Stokey, or at least semi-world-famous, partially famous, mildly famous. Especially after this show, you'll be very famous. Absolutely. Fifteen minutes of fame, uh, maybe less, fifteen seconds of fame in our own minds. But it's a pleasure to uh, be joining you again. Yeah, great to see you, as usual. So last, um, you know, on our last episode of the of the podcast, we talked about... Well, we talked about Advanced Squad Leader, and uh, specifically we talked about gliders, and so we're going to be talking about gliders and paratroopers and related things tonight. So if you haven't listened to that episode, and I notice a lot of people on TV now talk with their hands a lot. So, oh yes, Dave, may I, uh, Dave you have a question? <laughs> no, if you haven't listened to the episode, time oh, out. Time out. Go back and listen to it. Yes. And then come back to the Hangout. That's right. Or you can go both ways. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, stop. Yeah, and go back. Because there's a lot of so goodness over there. You know, it all works pretty well in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about gliders and, and it was coincidental because Dave and I said, uh, let's talk about gliders and then we, we wrote Rich and said, Hey, you wanna be on the show, we're gonna talk about gliders and coincidentally he had something going on with gliders. So what did you have going on? Well, you got, were... Yeah, I got a ton to say about gliders and paratroopers both. <laughs> And I'll start with, back at, uh, at ASLOC, Robert Banizic and I partnered up as the Germans against uh, Jeff DeYoung and against uh, Larry Zoet as the Partisans, and we played that enormous scenario, Russell Sprung, which some of you might have heard of. It's a heat, heat of battle scenario. I mean, this is a big scenario. And maybe you could call it up, Dave, while I'm, uh, while I'm talking. I know you have a copy of it. This is a very big scenario. It's six boards, six full boards. It's got, I don't have the exact count here, but it's got about 40 or 50 partisan squads plus reinforcements. It's got anti-aircraft guns. It's got about 26 paratroopers for the Germans, SS. It's got another 25 or so uh, gliders coming in. It is an enormous scenario, and it's a perfect scenario for two-on-two because Kind of half the scenario is played out on, on one side of the six boards, and the other victory condition is played out on the second half on the, on the other side, on the far, far right. And so there's like a battle for a hill on the one side, and there is a battle for a city on the other, which was not exactly reflected in that family picture of... <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. Keep talking. <laughs> So um, I wanted to get, I wanted to let you know what Robert and I did that was unsuccessful with respect to the tactics we used for um, the uh, gliders and the paratroopers, and then I want to you're going to tell us you're going to tell us what didn't work. I'm going to tell you what didn't work, and then I want to contrast that with a scenario I just played last Saturday. Again, it was a two-on-two here at my house with a different group of players, but it was still two-on-two. And this time, what the Germans did was successful on the second try. And so I want to, uh, you know, share that, you know, as a contrast of how do you, how, you know, the kind of tactics that you should consider using when you're using paratroopers and gliders in battle. Now this, this, you said this scenario is from Heat of Battle. Do you know when, approximately when this came out? Or, um, and did it include maps or counters, or was it just a scenario that you use with existing? It's just uh, a scenario that you use with existing. There you go. I'm glad you found it there, Dave. Ah. So if you could scroll down, you'll see it's FF14, that's the number, and you can see the six boards there at the top. 
So before we scroll any further, let's leave it, leave it where it is for just a second, Dave, on the upper left, just to paint the picture for you. So you, Board 3 is kind of a, like a town city board, if you remember. A lot of people know that. And then on the other side, Board 2, of course, is the big Level 3 hill uh, board that a lot of folks use and a lot of people have seen. And so pretty much if you read the victory conditions, let's go to the victory conditions for a second. And I'll get into the lighters, obviously, in a second. Where are the victory conditions? You see Holy cow. Here. Victory conditions. Tactical objective right there underneath, underneath the boards. Ah. Oh, yes. Scenario variables. So the Germans win if they capture Tito, who is a 10 negative 3 leader in the scenario. <laughs> cool. And it's almost impossible to capture a 10 negative 3 leader. So that's just in there kind of for flavor. Pretty much, though, you either have to... Um, Capture and control the cave. There's a cave on the level three hill that's that's installed there, and both they have to capture the cave, generally protected by Tito, and you have to control all the stone locations on board three. And there's nine of those. There's nine stone locations on board three. So pretty much, it's a perfect two-on-two -two scenario because it's very big, and because it kind of evolves into, um, you know, one side and the other. You know, playing, and you can you know go faster if you have two play people playing at the same time against two other players. So Robert Banizik and I, we feel we know the scenario very well. In fact, if you look there at the credits at the top, Robert Banizik helped design the scenario. So he obviously knows it even better than I do, probably. Although I feel like I caught up to him with as often as I've played this thing and studied it. So it's a very big scenario. Let's go down and look at the units just to give you a flavor. I'm not going to go through it all because it's too much. Go ahead and look for the uh, for the unit. So on the left, you got the partisans. You can see there's like 41 squads, and there's six crews. Oh. There's, there's machine guns. There's tons of leaders. There's big mortars. There's the anti-aircraft guns. There's an AFB. You know, you get the point. It's quite big. And you see the reinforcements that come on. And on the German side, it's kind of like 50-50. You got uh, turn one. You got those 26-plus paratroopers coming in and dropping down. And then on turn two, you've got those 25, or not quite that many, about 20 gliders coming wow. in. So it's That's a very big. big scenario. Yeah, it's very big. So what Robert and I did that was not successful, although we, you know, it wasn't random, we studied it and planned it and talked about it for months before we, uh, before we came in, or before we you know, played, we, we decided that we'd put about two-thirds or even maybe higher than two-thirds of the units on the level two or the board two hill side of the board or of the scenario. And about one-third would be geared towards the town, which is board three. Now, that's great to say, and that's a great strategy to, you know, suggest, but in reality, paratroopers are very unreliable. You just can't rely on paratroopers. There's a 50-50 chance, and you probably went through the rules last time, and you know there's a 50-50 chance they might land where you want. And even if they do land where you want, on the drop zone or the drop point, they, uh, you know, get scattered all over the place. So, you know, they have to go pick up their weapons. It takes a while to even get paratroopers in the game. They could land off board. It's, you know, you really can't rely on paratroopers. Gliders are way more accurate and way more able to control, and so when you know... So yeah, because said, with, with gliders, even if they land, even if they get blown off uh, track and land somewhere else, at least they're together and they've got their weapons with them. Exactly. And the they, men, can, yeah. and they, can fire, they can fire in the advancing fire phase, they can advance in the advance phase of the turn that they enter, the gliders can, so the gliders have a ton of advantages the paratroopers just don't have. So, knowing that, you really can't rely on the paratroopers. Nevertheless, Robert and I were fortunate in, in October at Aslock because four of our six, there's, there, we ended up with six sticks of those uh, 30 squads or so, or whatever the number was, 26 squads. And four of our six sticks landed where we wanted them to land. So, and they landed very safely and without harm. And the other two that wow. scattered, one of the ones that scattered just sort of landed in the middle of nowhere, but at least they weren't hurt. And the other one that scattered landed in a pretty good spot that was also helpful and also safe. So we were feeling great. We were feeling like, man, this is going good. Furthermore, one thing I didn't mention earlier was you get air support. The Germans get air support. If you look at the scenario card again. Uh, yep. 
put down in the right hand corner, you'll see you get four stukas in the beginning of the game. And, <sighs> and so I went, I, I rolled, I was fortunate, I, I spotted one of their anti aircraft guns, and I rolled snake eyes on the, uh, I got a critical hit with the bomb, a 200 millimeter bomb, a dream come true. It blew the gun completely out of the water. I think it even made a flame or something. And so uh, it was great. I mean, we were feeling like, man, we got this thing going. It's going our way. We're feeling good. And so, uh, you know, we proceeded. And I was the one on board three kind of on the hill, just sort of taking my time, working my way through the buildings. And then Robert uh, was attacking the hill. And he had, like I said, about two-thirds of the units at least, including the best leaders and machine guns. Anyway, so he surrounded the hill. And he was feeling good, feeling like everything's going great. And then to make a long story short, Tito was directing the uh, 50 caliber machine gun, which you can show him there, Dave, on the scenario card. Tito's the 10 negative 3 liter again. And the, 10 and the heavy machine gun there with uh, 8 firepower is one of their that, weapons. That darn Tito. And he just went nuts. He just was rolling and keeping rate and K slashing and killing leaders and cutting squads in half. And he just went on a rampage. And he just destroyed, I think, five of six of Robert's kill stacks all in one prep fire phase. Just completely was, uh, him. was Jermaine there too, and Michael, and the other Jacksons? No, I don't remember seeing them. I think they were on the reinforcement sheet. I'm thinking of Tito Jackson. Sorry. I, see. I didn't get it. Sorry about that, Jeff. <laughs> well, now, knowing that, um, this is going to make a lot more sense for, if, from here on out. So what we learned was, or what we decided was, so, so we were unsuccessful, we didn't win. So I, I, we did play out the other side of the board just for fun, and I was able to win on board uh, three, the, 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 the town board. I did eventually win over there, but that didn't matter, because if you're the Germans, you have to win, you know, on both sides to win. So, so we lost. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rich, who was your partner? Robert Banizic was my partner. One of the designers. You, I mean, yeah. you would think there would be... Oh, yeah, he knows it well. So I mean, he designed the scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we thought we had a great strategy, we thought we had a little bit of good luck with the Stukas, we had yeah. good luck with people, with the paratroopers landing two-thirds, you know, the, where we wanted them to. We couldn't have asked for more other than, you know, Tito had a very fortunate prep fire face. So what we decided was, or what I decided was, in the aftermath, I said, you know, there's no way, at least in my opinion, that the Germans can win this thing unless they're extremely aggressive with the gliders, which I'm going to cover in a minute as far as the rules of gliders, uh, on the very first turn that the gliders enter, which is turn two, and I'll explain my reasoning in a minute, but you know, if you just wait for the 10 negative 3 leader to shoot at you while you're moving towards the hill, I mean, he's going, unless he rolls a 12 and breaks the machine gun or something really bad like that, you know, eventually he's going to be rolling really good rolls. If you keep giving him a rate of fire of three and you keep using the 10 negative three, he's going to kill you. He's going to get you. Prep fire phase, defensive fire phase, he's going to get you. So I played again last, uh, it was two Saturdays ago at my house, and I was partners with Dave Ramirez, and we were against uh, Rich Domovic and Dave Goldman, who agreed to play the partisan side. And so Dave and I got together, Dave Ramirez and I got together the week before, and we planned an extremely aggressive strategy. We pretty much didn't even care about the paratroopers. We, I mean, we, yeah, certainly we tried to place them in good spots, but we didn't care. You know, wherever they land, they land, and we'll use them if we can use them. We wanted to be super aggressive with the gliders on the hill and just take our time with the, uh, you know, with the paratroopers and move them towards the city and take our time with the 11 turns that this scenario has. So one of the things that I want to talk about with the rules and with the strategy for gliders is this. If you land, I'm going to look at the little rules table here, if you could, if you could shoot over to that rules uh, chart. The, uh, yes, go to the gliders page. This is uh, Greg Dahl's paratrooper and glider summary sheet. <coughs> yes, excuse me. And we'll link it, or uh, I think it's linked on our other show. And you can see I have my own little notes here uh, that I've that I've scribbled in the margins. That's the paratrooper section. Scroll all the way to the uh, glider section, which is the second page. Yes, that's right. Oh, I lost it. Go back, please. Okay. I'm waiting for uh, Dave to bring it back up. 
Oh, it should be. Oh. Oh, there it is. Thank you. All right, so just leave it there for a bit. Oh, yeah, you don't you, need. If you click on it, Rich, on your screen, it will remain the active screen. Got it. Okay, very good. Thank you. I didn't know that. All right, so I'm not going to go through every single rule, but I want to go through some of the key rules that are extremely important when you're using gliders and if you choose to be aggressive with them like we did. So the first thing is we, we got really aggressive. We took like 20 of our 25 gliders and we landed them right on the level 3 and the level 2 hills, right on top of Tito and his minions. And you might think, wow, that's really aggressive. You're going to lose a lot of squads, and we did. <laughs> we did lose a lot of squads, but it still was very successful, and I'll tell you why. So the first thing is you land, you put your gliders on their intended land on their intended landing hex, the ILH, like it's called here. And again, I'm not going to go through every step. And they can attack. The first thing they do is they can attack with their anti-aircraft guns that are in anti-aircraft mode. So in this case, they had all three of their anti-aircraft guns ready to go, but they didn't expect us to attack that aggressively, and so they were faced the wrong way. So they had to turn their anti-aircraft guns, which means they had to add you know, add die roll modifiers to their to their shots, and they didn't hurt us that bad. I think they did blow one of our planes out of the sky, out of the 20, so I think they blew one of them out of the sky, and that was it. Not too bad. So that was not too bad. But then, um, you actually have to roll for, you know, uh, the landing. So if you scroll down to, like, that point number four, Dave, four and five. Land die roll here. Yeah, land die roll. So we were aggressive. We landed right on the trenches and right on the crest lines. And so you do have to roll, you know, um, it's not an automatic safe landing. You do have to roll uh, a decent number, like I think four or less with one die if you're adding two or adding one to keep it less than or equal to six, like it says there on step number five. So, but generally, I think we had one or two crash. And if you crash, that, that suffers casualty <coughs> reduction. So I think we had one or two of the gliders crash, again, which is like a K slash, so a full squad becomes a half squad. And that's, you know, it's just acceptable damage. That you yeah, have it's to tolerable, take. yeah. Yeah, because it just, it's just one of the squads. Yeah, and I think two of our, I don't remember exactly, but I think two of them crashed, and, you know, I kind of expected that. I mean, that's the way it yeah. is. Okay, then scroll down to step six, please. And now we're getting down to the key strategy of why this works. Final fire. Yeah, so now it's final fire. So now... The gliders have landed, and, you know, in many cases, they have triple point blank fire on, and you treat it as an unarmored vehicle. So, like, for example, Tito had a 527 squad and a heavy machine gun, 8 firepower, so that's 13 firepower, and you triple that, of course, because it's in the hex, right? So you got 39 firepower, 36 firepower, and if you look at your chart, I just happen to have it with me, the star number on that is 13. The unarmored vehicle line is a 13. And you got a negative 3 modifier to boot. So you're saying to me, well, Rich, you know, unless they roll a 12, almost anything they roll is going to destroy the glider. And I, my answer to you is yes, that's true. However, the key rule that I really want to point out to the listeners that I learned myself and that's from reading the rules a lot, and also I talked to uh, Bob Bendis, who's one of these expert players that knows a lot about it, and he also referred me to this and encouraged me to use this rule. There's no such thing in the glider rules as a burning wreck. So even if Tito rolls a two, which is way less than or equal to half of yeah, the right. number, there's no such thing as a burning wreck. So the crew survival number is seven, which you can see right there on step six. Yeah. So even though, so I don't remember exactly what they rolled, but whatever it was, you, if you get a 7, your unit is fine. So yes, I can't remember exactly which units rolled what, but there were a couple of, you know, rolls that were less than the star number, and we rolled for, and sometimes we rolled higher than 7. I can't remember all the statistics now, but sometimes we didn't. And so that ties up their fire. They could only fire within their own hex, and, you know, unless they destroy the thing and keep rate, which, you know, happens, but the odds are against that happening. So the point is we had 20 of these gliders. One got shot out of the sky by anti-aircraft. A couple of them crashed, and maybe four or five more were destroyed by rolling greater than seven on the crew survival, but we still had about 12 or 11 that survived, and those had flamethrowers, which could then fire in the advancing fire phase right at Tito, point blank, 24 firepower flat, 
And sure enough, we got that turkey and took advantage of these rules. So we were extremely aggressive. Now we lost, you know, eight squads right off the bat out of the 20, you know, which is bad, a lot of death. But we, you got to get Tito. you got to get him. And we took advantage of the fact that there's no such thing as a burning wreck, and the crew survival of seven is a pretty good, pretty good number, not that hard to roll seven or less. And we chose this aggressive strategy, and it worked, it worked well. So I was very excited to share that with you guys. It's, I don't know if it's a glitch in the glider rules, or uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a glitch. I really think that's the way it is. So that's a key, uh, that's a key rule, and uh, that's the tactic that you want to use when you're using gliders. Paratroopers are very vulnerable. Para one of our paratroopers landed right on that level two hill, and they were just decimated. I think of the six squads or five squads, I, if not all of them, almost all of them were just destroyed through, you know, they break and they can't route, and they, uh, you know, they're surrounded by enemy units, and they surrender or they're eliminated from failure to route. The paratroopers are just so vulnerable, you just can't count on them. But the gliders, you can really do something with. So anyway, that's that's the... I guess the strategy with respect to those things that I wanted to share. Yeah, Jeff and I noticed they don't burn when we were doing our show and uh, thinking about, well, gas tanks? They don't have, they're gliders. Right. They're not, they don't have engines, right? They're not that's loaded right. with gas yeah. or anything. That's so. right. So that's a key rule. Now, when they get shot down by the anti-aircraft, then they're destroyed and there is no crew survival. They're all just dead. Right. Yeah, but as, in my experience with gliders, too, has been that very few, and I was telling Jeff, get shot down out of the air. That's been right. my experience. Yeah, it's hard. you got to roll a pretty low number. It happens. You can do it, especially if you have anti-aircraft guns. The other strategy I want to point out for the Defender, which I uh, observed, is this is both against the paratroopers and the gliders, both. You can mark a heavy machine gun with an anti-aircraft marker so that's prepared to fire like that, and you can do that. But you don't want to do that, in my opinion. Why now, is that? Well, the reason you don't, there's two reasons why you don't. Now, against paratroopers, you will get the minus two hazardous movement modifier, so that tempts you to want to mark your heavy machine gun with the anti-aircraft marker because then you, know, you get the minus two modifier. But if you, if you read the rules very carefully, when you use, the, when you use a heavy machine gun in anti-aircraft mode, it doesn't get any rate of fire, and it can't be directed by leaders. And it can cower. All three. So you're only going to get one shot for sure. Yes, you'll get a negative two modifier with it, but it, even if you roll low or roll rate of fire, you don't get rate of fire when it's in anti-aircraft mode. So yeah, opinion, that is correct. Yeah, so in my opinion, it's worth not putting your heavy machine gun in anti-aircraft mode in order to keep your leadership direction, in order to keep your rate of fire po opportunity even though you are giving up the minus two modifier versus the, uh, the paratroopers. So strategy on the defensive side is don't mark your heavy machine gun with anti-aircraft. Leave it, you know, in normal mode. It's going to be more effective. And wait, wait until the, uh, the troops actually hit the ground and then go after them. I think so. That's yeah. my opinion, and I guess that's what I would do if I were the defender in this scenario. Okay. Now, the anti-aircraft guns, of course, they could be in anti-aircraft mode, no problem, and they should be, and you want them to be. Right. But the heavy machine gun is what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Well, great. That's uh, quite fascinating. Um, what I wanted, I have a board set up here, and I don't know if this happened to you when you were playing your scenario, Rich, but we were talking about this, of course, when we covered the rules, and we were talking about the avenue of approach. And uh, one of the things that I, I had a hard time describing was what happens if your glider is coming in on an avenue of approach that is either very close to the edge of the board or for some reason you get um, redirected. Well, what's the proper term here? Um, evade. Forced to evade. evade. Forced to evade, evade. yes, thank you. Uh, where you. Where you're getting off, to, off the board or close to the edge of the board. And so I've set up a, a board for here, which is the same board that they use in the rules in uh, Chapter E, uh, Section 8, which mm -hmm. covers gliders. And it shows here how when a glider is on the edge of the board, so here's a glider. I'm going to stand up here. This is my intended landing hex right here, and you can see the glider in it. 
here's my marker that shows the uh, the wind direction that I hit, rolled at the beginning of the scenario and so the wind is is coming from this direction therefore the glider is heading into the wind yep and this could be actually my intended landing hex or it could be that I've evaded to this point but you can see that this angle of uh, um, the avenue of approach goes out behind the glider now when you're when you don't have enough board space to cover that what you what you do is you take the same terrain that's in the mirror image of this angle so here's the avenue the actual avenue of approach goes out five hexes behind the glider but when you calculate the terrain in order to to figure out your modifiers when you're landing you use the terrain that's the mirror image which is in this case is directly in front of the glider yep that's absolutely right Jeff so if I got now, now this is where it gets a little weird uh, and I've used a desert board here just just to keep the hexes in uh, uh, in perspective but if I get uh, another if I'm forced to evade again over to this point the angle of approach shifts likewise this way oh interesting I never the, thought about uh, sorry, that. the avenue of approach goes off this way so yeah it's a little odd um, well, to look wanna... at, it's a little odd to think about when, but when you actually put it out on the board, then it then it makes sense. So, and that this is a case in particular where it's good to have a board. You could just lay the stuff out, follow what they talk about uh, in the rules section, and it becomes clear then when that happens, what, what, how that works. So, kind of odd, kind of bizarre, but it makes sense too. Well, where it could hurt you is like if you were trying to land. I don't, I can't quite read the. Uh... I think is that K10? What is that? This is um, the, the row that the glider is in is row P. Yeah, I know that. But try to land in um, next to the woods. I can't see. I cannot read. Uh, here? No, keep going to your left. No? Here? Okay, the other way. The other way. Yeah, it's uh, it's the 10, the 10 hex. The 10. Uh, That's T. T10. Okay, go to S10. Go to S10. S is in SAM 10. Try to land in S10. Yeah, put the glider there for a second. Okay, so now if you do the mirror image, you would have a wood. You'd have a woods hex. Uh, I guess two hexes behind the glider, right? You'd have a level one woods hex. Or is that in? Oh, behind because it's a mirror. Right. Right. So two, would it be? Yeah, it'd be yeah two hexes behind. behind the glider. That's right. Right. So remove all the all the little. Uh, stones except for the one that's two behind the glider. Is that in front of the glider? We'll remove all the ones except for the one that's two behind the glider. Behind the glider. Behind the glider, okay. Yeah, except that one. One. yeah. And yeah, that's right. So that's like a woods hex. The one that you left there is like a woods hex? Uh, yes, that's right. So that's a level one and it's two hexes behind the glider. So when you roll for, I'll go back to that chart now if you would for a second, Dave. Oh. Did you close that? Oh, yeah, so when you're rolling to uh, land, right? So on your landing, in this case, in this example, where you've got a woods hex two behind the glider on the land die roll, you get minus one on step four. Look at step four. You get minus one for each hex of clear, clear terrain, which in this case is minus one. You only have one hex of clear terrain. Yeah, and then the plus one for the full level of right, the so obstacle behind it. That's right. So you'll, in this case, you'd have a zero. So when you roll for your um, landing crash die roll it has to be less than or equal to one so unless you roll a one on the color die roll of your land die roll it's not going to be accurate in this case so the odds are five out of six that it will not land where you want it to land right because the trees are there yes but I, and I'm sorry I should have said this before are you, are you doing this right the glider is here the, actually, the hex directly behind the glider would have trees in it. This one. Well, no, it, no. You can still use T. I think is that is that. I can't read the letters. I'm so sorry. It's yeah, that's oh. T. This is T nine. Okay, so what's right behind the glider? What's the row there? R ten. Okay, so R ten is clear. So you can leave it clear. Oh yes, you're right. I'm On sure. this board. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. That's right. And so then the woods is two behind it. Yes. So the odds are five out of six that this is not going to land where you want it to land. Yeah. 
that's where it can hurt you is uh, when there is a level one or level two or some kind of or a building or something like that that gets behind you. So what are you, what are you showing us here, Dave? I think the first game you might want to play if you're going to try your gliders is Tavernitis Bridge. And where's this from? Now it started with the annual A1. First okay. scenario in the annual, republished as 93. And its roar record was like 40 pro German against like 20 something for the British. And so you want to play the 93 number that came with, uh, what was it, Rich reissued with uh, Beyond Valor or the um, for King and Country, I think? Yeah, I've seen that scenario. I don't remember it offhand, but I know I've seen it. But that's much yeah. simpler. That's much simpler than Russell Sprung. I don't remember. I don't recommend starting with that. No, right. The uh, the re the reissue one in '93 was um, about 50-50 on the victory on the roar record, and it has ten gliders and ten troops for the Germans, and then just five defenders. They got to land under this bridge in this like dry valley, and then they charge up the hill. And I remember losing this to Wally. I have it marked even here who I lost to. In the last turn, as the Germans came running up to this last building I was trying to hold, and I failed my morale check. And beating Wally would have been a big deal for me back in the day. Uh, and also, A2 is Bofors Bashing. This is Mal Malim Crete, 1941. And so is this one. That's May 20th. Yeah, they're both the same day, even. So they're like a two parter. So you could play this side, Bofors Bashing, which adds the. Um, Sorry, what, what nationality are those? British, German, Crete. Oh, okay. British, German, and Crete. And it adds the uh, AA guns on this one, so you could practice with that, whereas the other side didn't have that. To, to you know, So you could concentrate on just learning your glider rules here yeah. and then play this one, A2, which I don't know, I'm imagining is like 94 or something in the reissue. It's got to be a reissue. I didn't double-check that. but And then you get to... Um, I think, is there a way these two go together? Or no, this one's kind of the same thing, just up, up gun. So you have more variety here. Yeah, I agree. That's I, a, good, I would, a good way to learn. Yeah, definitely recommend that as a starting place. And there are good examples in the rule book that you can follow. And, you know, this chart that Greg Dahl, whom I don't know, put together. But, but I found Greg's charts helpful. But I, you know, as you saw on that chart, I had to take my own notes to clarify a few things that you know help me understand it better. Yeah, I kind of like seeing your notes on there. Yeah, you could sell this, Rich. You could oh, sell sure. this. Very no, valuable. Mr. Daw would have to get his share of the cut. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, and we need our share, Dave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of course. So, well, Rich, did you when you were preparing um, for this scenario? Did you didn't play any? Uh, like practice scenarios that included gliders or anything like that, did you? Well, no. I didn't play any practice scenarios, but uh, Dave and I actually did simulate, Dave Ramirez and I actually did simulate, we set up a hypothetical uh, partisan, you know, level three defense with machine guns and leaders and trenches and, t and Tito and the, and the eight firepower heavy, you know, machine gun. And we did simulate doing what I just described verbally of landing right on top of them and seeing what would happen. And so we did actually simulate our attack to see how bad it would be or how crazy it would be. And I think Dave was surprised because when I first proposed it, he's like, oh, Rich, that's not going to work. They're just going to get destroyed. <laughs> that's what I was thinking, too, when you first said that. I'm like, and I, no. And i, and I got to give credit to Bob Bendis. I can't take credit for this. Bob's the one that encouraged me to consider it. He... Uh, twisted my arm hard because I asked for his advice and he said Rich you gotta do it I'm telling you that's the only way to beat Tito and I, I didn't believe him at first but I simulated it and we tested it and it, you know it doesn't always work and if they know you're gonna do that they can probably set up to really nail you if they know you're gonna do that but if they set up what I'll call a normal defense which doesn't anticipate that hugely aggressive move it'll work quite but amazing no, but I've lost the scenario three or four times before I got to this point. Yeah. So I didn't just stumble. I mean, I, I know how to lose this scenario. Believe me, I've only won it once. <laughs> you know, do you ever do you ever play a scenario and you keep on losing, but you just know you should be able to win? Do you ever um, have that? I'm going to have to say yes. That happens to me. 
I know it's possible to win. <laughs> I do know that. Dave, do you ever have a scenario that you just keep losing, but you just know you can win it? Not a lot, because I'm always moving off to the next scenario. Now, I played this one twice, lost with the Germans, and then I won with the Germans. My little notes here. And so then I was off to Balfour's bashing, and then from there, off to the next one. Well, occasionally I just get hung up on one, and I just insist on playing it I, until I win. I think that's a gr actually a great idea, actually. I do, too. I know from, for myself, when I was first learning uh, ASL, I like taking the same scenario and playing it multiple times, switching sides and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. It really, I... really helped it drill into my head. Now, the one I did do with that was with that Wally guy that taught me the streets of, uh, what was that one? Streets, streets of Stalingrad? Yes. Yeah, yeah. with that attacking that. I mentioned it before on the on the show. I, I, I defend as the Russian in the factory. He blows me apart across the street with first fire, I mean with prep fire, right? Easily crosses the street, gets in the factory. So we switch sides. I'm like, now I'm going to blast you away in prep fire. And he set up interior hexes and made me come into the building <laughs> and hit me with first fire. And then I'm like, Dang, I can't beat this guy. So, yeah, that one we played a lot. But that was back in the day, right? So. Yeah. Oh, I hate when they do that. Well, um, I think we've actually... What's our time, Jeff? Yeah, yeah we've got uh, 48 minutes into this. and so On I this one? I think, actually, this is not a bad spot to stop because I would love to spend yeah, some time on Rich's, um, on Rich's charts and tables, but I think we should save that for another show. Okay. Which we can do, you know, in the very near future. And in when we're recording this, as we were talking about this, I thought it would be a great show uh, to talk about how to play in teams and and what do you do when you're playing teams of two? How and do you I'm divide gonna... it up? How do you divide up the uh, you know troops. the troops? The troops and who's in, yep, who's in charge not, of what? And, not get mad at your fellow player when he doesn't go the way you would go or yeah, follow exactly. your advice or who so, gives the advice? Do you have one guy be the general? I, or? I, can, I can share some examples of, uh, of, of fighting between each other a little bit. I know like when Robert and I played it was not a big deal but uh, you know how you're allowed to do a multi-man counter self-start you know at the beginning of your prep fire or beginning of your rally phase on your turn yes. of course you know that. Well mm -hmm. you know I just went ahead and rolled for one. I didn't even ask him for his advice or if he had one that he thought was worth doing. I just was doing my own thing on my side of the board and I did it. And of course I was unsuccessful because I had a DM guy and he needed like a four or something. And so Robert turned to me and said, well, why'd you do that for? I had one over here that needed a nine because he's not DM anymore. He could have asked me, you know, and I just went ahead and did it myself and I felt bad, but he was right. I should have let him do it. You want to show us the scar that you have actually now from that, uh, yeah, so it's quite painful. I feel, yeah. <laughs> I feel awful. But, but anyway, but that's a that's a lesson learned is communicate with your partner and give him the chance if you think he's got a better chance. Or like when there's sniper attacks, you might want to take a sniper here or there, and you should talk about it. And you can't just you know plow ahead with your own thing and ignore your partner. Well, we've got. Uh, I would say we have a number of topics then to cover with you, Rich, in the near future. One would be that how to play with. Uh, you know, a, a four-player game where you're playing partners on sides. Uh, one would be to cover your tables. We want to do that as soon as possible because you've got a lot of good mm -hmm. stuff there. Yeah, I've added four and, or five uh, since we've last spoken, I think, that are worth uh, looking at. Yeah. So um, come and join us in the broadcast foxhole or here on another Hangout or whatever in the near future, and we'll look forward to that. And I'm sure our listeners will, too. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That'll be fun. That's great. Dave, you got somebody in your broadcast foxhole. I see. I see somebody peeking out. What? An entity of some kind, a carbon unit. Who is that? I, I don't see anything. Is that Adam? I don't see anything. Do you, is he gone? Okay. I don't okay. know what you're talking about, Jeff. All right. Well, <clears throat> anyway. Gone. Anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, Rich, very much. Yep, you coming bet. and spending the time and uh, and very informative. Yeah, it was cool. fun. Thanks. Yeah, and remember, Rich, do you remember our, our closing? Well, I can try. Okay. Roll low. And rally well. But uh, not ah, when you're, you're playing, playing us. Up. Yep, got it. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. See you next See you time. Go. Well, you got Churchill. Hold on. Oh, Winston. Yep, bye. Hitler knows that he must break us in this island or lose the war. Oh, very good, Dave. Well, not very good, but... Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, bye, everyone. Yeah.